major problem with theistic arguments is the fact that they are riddled with hidden premises and unspoken assumptions. The commonly used syllogisms do not accurately represent what is actually being argued for. So I would like to reformulate these theistic arguments for the sake of clarity. And for the apologists watching this, there is no problem with reformulating someone else's arguments as long as you represent the content of the argument correctly. You may think that the original syllogism is sufficient, you may like the original more, but that's a matter of preference. As long as you agree with every single premise of the reformulation and agree that all of those points are what's being argued for in the argument, then there can be no objection to the reformulated version. If I would make an argument and someone else would reformulate it, but still represent it correctly, I would have no objection to that. Let's start with the Kalam cosmological argument. The original goes as follows. Premise 1. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Premise 2. The universe began to exist. Conclusion. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Seems clear and concise, but it is not. This is what actually is being argued for. Premise 1. Presentism is true. Premise 2. It is possible for something to come into existence ex nihilo. Premise 3. If something comes into existence ex nihilo, it must have a cause. Premise 4. Something comes into existence if it exists at T is X and there is no time prior to T is X at which it exists. Premise 5. All of physical reality came into existence. Premise 6. If all of physical reality came into existence, it came into existence ex nihilo. Premise 7. Substance dualism is true. Premise 8. The cause of physical reality was a mind. Premise 9. This mind is itself uncaused. Premise 10. This mind has libertarian free will. Conclusion. All of physical reality was caused by a non-physical mind whose existence and decision to create had no preceding external cause. So let me explain this reformulation. Regarding premise 1, presentism needs to be true for anything to come into existence. If presentism is false, the entire argument goes out of the window anyway, so it's a logical first premise. And on a side note, William Lane Craig actually agrees with this. That is why he wrote several books in defense of presentism, or the dynamic theory of time. Regarding premise 2, in order to speak of ex nihilo creation, the concept must be coherent. If it is not, then you cannot use it in an argument. It is hardly a given that this is a coherent concept, and since we are only familiar with what we could label as ex materia creation, this should be included as a premise, as it has to be established in order for the argument to work. Regarding premise 3, this is basically the original first premise with the removal of the obfuscation between ex materia and ex nihilo. Regarding premise 4, this is the definition of what it means for something to come into existence given by William Lane Craig himself. Regarding premise 5, instead of using the word universe, we need to make clear what actually is being argued for. Not merely the coming into being of our currently known area of space-time, but all of physical reality. This is after all an argument for supernaturalism, and a specific form of supernaturalism to be precise. Regarding premise 6, this needs to be a premise because this is an argument for supernaturalism. Under naturalism or materialism, the absence of physical reality equals the absence of reality altogether. This is not the case under supernaturalism. So a distinction has to be made between nothing and the mere absence of the physical because these are not equal under supernaturalism. Regarding premise 7, this is required for the argument to be an argument for the existence of God based on the physical world having an external cause. Under idealism there is no physical world to come into being in the first place, and under materialism the physical world cannot have come into existence and have an external cause. And it also would exclude the existence of a supernatural mind by definition. But the mere distinction between a physical and non-physical world is not sufficient. A necessary premise is that the mental is of the non-physical and not of the physical. Therefore, there needs to be a premise that substance dualism is true. Regarding premise 8, 
This follows from the previous premise, but it is not a conclusion. It is very much a premise. Because proponents of the argument try to establish that the cause of physical reality was a non-physical mind and not a non-physical, non-mental entity. Even if you believe that there are no supernatural entities other than minds, then that would be what you would have to argue for. Therefore, this premise needs to be included as a premise, not a conclusion. Because so far it doesn't necessarily follow from the premises. Regarding premise 9, this premise needs to be included in order to argue that this non-physical mind is God. After all, proponents of this argument define God as being uncaused. So let's say that we would discover tomorrow that physical reality was caused by a non-physical mind which itself had a cause external to it, then that would certainly be incompatible with naturalism, but it would also be incompatible with classical theism. Even if causation from the mind that has a cause could be traced back to an uncaused mind, that still would be incompatible with classical monotheism, since it's part of that view that it was God who created all of physical reality and not some sort of lesser being. That view is compatible with some religions, but not the religions of the apologists who actually use this argument nowadays. Regarding premise 10, this last premise is the only one that might not be required, but I included it for two specific reasons. One, because William Lane Craig, the main proponent of this argument, argues that the cause of time requires libertarian free will. And two, because proponents of the argument do not believe that God created the physical world randomly or that his decision was caused by an external factor. They believe God is the absolute first cause without any precedent. So you might want to leave this premise out, but there are reasons to include it. And then finally we have the conclusion. However, keep in mind that even if we grant the entire argument, we only get part of the God concept that the apologists using this argument actually believe in. It is not an argument for their God concept as a whole, but only part of it, let alone a specific religion of course. Moreover, we also need to realize that even if we grant the entire argument, we do not gain any actual understanding of how the physical world was created and what specific agent was involved apart from the very limited properties of being uncaused, some sort of mental entity, and it being non-physical. Also, this is merely a syllogism. It is a tool for making the argument, it is not itself evidence. All of the premises require evidence. A syllogism like this would merely be a tool for drawing a conclusion from the evidence. And as you can see, that's quite a burden the apologist takes upon himself by presenting an argument like this. So what do I think of this argument? Well, I think every single premise is either false, unsupported or unprovable.